Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Necton Submarine STEM 2020. It's wonderful to have you all with us. And we have many, many homeschoolers from around the world. It seems we're all homeschooling now. But to welcome all those who are watching, we've got a range of countries. We've got people watching from the United Kingdom, from Thailand, Singapore, India, UAE, Australia, the USA, uh, uh, Germany, Switzerland, uh, Spain, and the Ukraine. So welcome, one and all. Amazing to have you with us. Now, we've got a really, really special live lesson for you today. It's Mountains Under the Sea, and very soon we'll be introducing you to Dr. Lucy Woodall, who will be telling us about this amazing underwater habitat. But first of all, a big shout out and thanks to Inmarsat, uh, who are making Necton Submarine uh, Live 2020 possible, uh, and to all those who are supporting this amazing work uh, to explore the deep ocean. Yesterday, we heard a little bit about the expedition and the organization behind it uh, from Oliver Steeds. And today, we are really excitingly going to find out more about mountains under the sea. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Lucy Woodall. Good morning, Lucy. Hey, morning, everyone. Morning, Jamie. Hi. How are Great you? To have you all online. I'm great, thank you. Yes, yeah, really, I'm looking forward to sharing some of the really interesting aspects of the underwater world, things that we might not think about when we just go down to the beach and hang out in rock pools, but we think that there's this whole other world down there that I'm going to share a little bit about today. Brilliant. And I think for the format of this call, Lucy, you've got some slides and some sort of background information that you've got ready to share with uh, the young people who are, who are watching um, today. And I think we've got time afterwards for um, Q&A, if we we'll go through some of the questions. Just if you are watching, a couple of points. Um, we've got the live chat ready and you can post as many questions as you would like there. And we'll get to those in about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, we do ask um, that you treat the live chat like you treat a classroom. Um, so make sure that it's, it's sort of educationally focused uh, questions and comments on there. And we do have teachers moderating. Uh, but thank you very much. And I'm going to pass back uh, to Lucy to take you through this wonderful world of the deep ocean and sea maps. Brilliant. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so this morning, we're going to be thinking about our mountains and the ocean and we call these sea mounts. And as you can imagine, the ocean is really huge. So we're going to look this morning and figure out what it's like below the surface of the deep sea. We're also going to think about sea mounts, where they are, what they are, and also what makes them really special. So that means we're gonna learn about the life that's on them and learn about why the life is there. So here we go. So this first image you can see, well, you can see that it's our planet Earth. And if you look very carefully, you might see the brown landmass of Australia over there on the right side of the screen. Down at the bottom, you've got the continent of Antarctica, all white in amongst the clouds. But what do you really notice? You really notice that our planet, our planet Earth, it's actually planet ocean. Most of our planet is ocean. So that's over 70% of the surface of our planet is water. And this means that it's important because most of the life on the planet is in the water. It's not on land like us. But it also means because the ocean encompasses so much of the planet, that it's really important for our processes. So things like our winds and our weather, all of that is driven by our ocean. So what does it look like below that blue? And if any of you have been down to the beach on your holidays or maybe on a school trip, you'll have looked out and seen a line, a line between the air and the water. But actually, that's not really a line. That's just the start of this really amazing habitat. 
And as you can see here on the picture, there is a lot of really interesting shape on the sea floor. So it's not just a flat line. There are mountains and ridges, hills and valleys under the water, just like there is on land. It's just that they're harder to see. I, we can't go in there and empty the ocean, so we just don't get to see them. But now, using remote technologies, looking um, using satellites, and also um, much more detailed um, using equipment like echo sounders that you might have heard about yesterday on ships, we can get a really good pattern of what these shapes look like. So, of course, we've got, as Jamie's told us, you guys from across multiple different countries. So just take a moment, figure out where you are. If you're here in the UK, like me, then you can see there's a ridge down to the side of us. And actually the North Sea is quite flat. If you're in the Indian Ocean, where I've just come back from, there's some ridges and some valleys. We're gonna look at that in a bit more detail. So all of these dark lines down the middles of our oceans are our mid-Atlantic ridges. And this is where our tectonic plates that make up the surface of the Earth have collided. So as I promised, the Indian Ocean in a bit more detail. So these are one of the maps that are produced by scientists to help them understand the sea floor. And down through the middle, you will see kind of a line um, and you can see one of the orange arrows. And this shows the ridge going all the way down from north to south. The next line over to the left side shows you a little, a little ridge, but it's of lots of these hills and seamounts. And that's where I should have been right now. And that's where our expedition was going to explore from Seychelles to the Coco de Mer Ridge and then all the way over to Maldives. We can also see on the arrow on the far left is a trench, so one of the valleys that we see. But of course, just like on land, there are some flat pieces, and that arrow over on the right side at the bottom shows you that there are some areas that actually are pretty flat. So we've looked at a big picture of the planet and the sea floor. What does that look like in a lot of detail? What does a seamount really look like? Well, of course, it's very dark down there. So I can't show you a picture of an entire seamount because often they're like the whole sizes of towns and villages. But here we have a representation and this map just looks like a map on land. So the red po points up at the top are the shallowest pieces. And then we go all the way down through the colors of the rainbow. Every 100 meters, you see those white lines and all the way down to purple, which is down at about 2,500 meters. So just like you'd see a map on the land, we have them of the sea mounts in the ocean. So I said that we couldn't show you an entire sea mount at the same time, like a big picture, like an aerial view that we could on land. But what we do see is small pieces of the ocean. And I'm firstly gonna show you some parts of the ocean that are not on seamounts. And here it is. And I think you're probably saying, well, Lucy, that's not that exciting. Well, you're right. A lot of the ocean is quite flat and it's in thick sediment. But that doesn't mean that nothing lives there. Okay, so we can see that there's tiny animals up there on the screen. And when you dig down deep and you look under your microscope, you find very small worms. So this is a special small worm that I was looking at a few years ago. It's called a trichoma. You might be able to see on its head. It's just got like three little pieces on its head, hence its name. And if you were to scoop up a mug of sediment from the ocean, you're gonna find about 30 of these worms. And that's across the whole of the seabed. So can you imagine, that's millions and millions and millions of these worms that are in the ocean. So just because you can't see them in some of these pictures, 
doesn't mean to say that they're not there. Now in this picture, again, we have a sediment sea floor. It's quite flat. We can see lots of different things here, and I'm just going to talk you through them. So the first thing we see is that little pink thing coming up, and that's actually coral. We call them sea pens, and they're related to the coral that you might have seen in some of these other shows, thinking about the shallow water coral reefs. We've also got a sea cucumber there in the middle. We actually call one of those a sea pig. Um, and they ferret around on the sea floor, pulling up lots of dis different things that have settled down to the seabed. And of course, you'll see lots of brittle scars. You can see them with their arms outstretched, pulling food into their mouths that are the middle of their face. So here I've introduced a lot of the creatures. Some of them I'm sure we haven't seen before because us as scientists going to explore the deep sea um, are discovering these for the first time. Um, but there is a lot of diversity and I'm going to share that diversity of corals with you. So we've already mentioned there are shallow water, warm water coral reefs. We've seen this sea pen in the sediment. And this, this is what a seamount looks like. Look at all that life, all that diversity, all those different shapes and sizes and colors. They're all different species of coral. I find that quite challenging to get my mind around because there's a whole lot there and we're only looking at about five meters square, just like one of the rooms that we're sitting in now. So here what we can see are these soft corals. So as you might have noticed, not all corals are in shallow water. Um, here they're in, in cold water and they filter things that come past them. Um, and they feed on these um, rather than using light as their energy source. The corals we see here are soft bodied. So it's like they move around with the water currents, just like plants do in the wind on land. And these are our soft corals. And I'm just going to give you another example here. We've got lots of different types of coral. But of course, the big one that's really obvious is that pink one there in the middle. And this is called an octocoral. And in the next slide, we'll be able to see why it's an octocoral. We can also notice, if you look very carefully, that you can see snake sea stars. And they live on this octocoral. Look at them right now. You can only see them on the coral, and they don't live anywhere else. So this is a really important point. But not only do really interesting um, creatures live on seamounts, but they're also homes for others. Well, this is a magnification of that last picture that you've seen. And you can see in more detail some of these snake sea stars and even an anemone over on the left hand side. But you can also see the large polyps that are out and those little polyps that looks like the um, the furry outsides of the corals. Um, it's those that um, capture the food as it's coming past in the water and feeds um, the rest of the coral. It's like lots of little mouths. But not all coral and not all seamounts look like this. We also have hard coral. And it's called hard coral, not surprisingly, really, because it lives um, on the seamounts and forms a hard skeleton. Um, they might look slightly more like some of the shallow warm water coral reefs that you might have seen. And they form these dense thickets. Uh, and we can already see from this image that they are home to lots of other things. So in the background, you can see sort of the white, slightly see-through sponges. And then you can also see some sea snails. Well, when we zoom in on these types of environments, we can see a lot of things. So again, we can see those sea snails in the middle. We can see a crab over on the left-hand side. 
a sea urchin with its spines down there at the bottom. And then did you spot it right in the middle, little fish pointing out with its two little eyes? And this shows that, of course, the coral itself is really important, but it's the homes that they create for other organisms that mean that there's a lot of diversity on these seamounts. And these corals live here because they're hard substrates. So not full of sediment like we looked at in those first few pictures, it's just bare rock. That means that these animals can attach to the rock. So we've seen a lot of diversity of different corals. Um, and we've seen that they provide homes for different organisms. However, seamounts are not just homes for sessile life, and that means life that is attached to the seabed. They also are homes for some of our mobile predators. And I'm showing you some pictures here of two fish and one of our seabirds. So let's start with a seabird. And I took this picture and back in 2012 when I was down in the Southern Ocean, just south of South Africa. So between South Africa and Antarctica. And these birds often accumulate around the seamounts because that's where the food is. Now, fish also congregate around them. Um, and here we can see a chimera. And in that little picture of the chimera, you might think that it looks like an other type of fish. What do you think? Maybe a shark? And that's correct because chimeras are types of sharks. Different ones than you'll see in the shallows, but very important in the deep sea. And then the big picture on your screen is pretty cool. One of my favorites, and that's an anglerfish. And anglerfish live down in the deep waters. They lure prey towards them with their little fishing light. And that's what it's got sticking up above its mouth. And then an enlargement of it is on the right hand side of your screen. And in this little light bulb, bacteria live and they light up and um, attract prey towards the anglerfish, which then eats it. And you'll notice that the fish itself looks a pretty funny color, not nice and bright. Um, it doesn't look like light would shine off it. You know, like other fish like mackerel and tuna look like um, they're kind of mirror-like. Mirror um, but this anglerfish is almost black and it has a velvety surface. And this is on purpose so that it doesn't shine any light down at depth, which would give it away. Really, really interesting. Okay, so here we're just going to do a little summary of seamounts. So the first thing to remember is the sea floor has got lots of valleys and mountains, and it's not just flat. Seamounts are like mountains under the ocean, and we can think of them just like islands, but they just haven't stuck their heads up out of the ocean. They connect the deep ocean floor with shallow waters, and that means there's a lot of animals that live there, and we're connecting our shallow water animals with those in the deep sea. Most of the sea floor we've seen is covered with a thick layer of mud, and the life there is very small. But seamounts, they're hard, they're like rock, so different life grows there. And this life attracts other creatures and it's home to still more. Um, and this makes them a hot spots for life. So for example, whales on their big migrations are thought to use seamounts as navigating spots. So they know where they are on their long migrations. So pretty neat. You've just touched on some of the aspects of seamounts, but hopefully now you'll realize that as we look out over the ocean when we're on our coasts and on our beaches, that there's a lot of really interesting things under the ocean that are super, super deep. So I think now we're on to questions. And this is me in a submersible looking at one of those seamounts. Lucy, uh, thank you so, so much. Um, and extraordinary to think that 
you know, beneath that surface, when we gaze out from a beach, uh, is this extraordinary um, world where we have the same types of things that we have on land, but but un- under the water. And there's a, there's quite a few questions coming up about some some sort of seamount basics. Um, could you could you let us know perhaps what what the biggest mountain underwater is? And that's a question from 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 Oscar. Yeah, Oscar, really great question. And you know that is something that scientists are still trying to figure out. So we think it's um, Mauna Kea, which is um, near uh, Hawaii, so in the Pacific, on a range of seamounts called the Emperor Seamounts. And the reason why we think it's there, um, but we can't absolutely say, is because we haven't mapped the whole of the ocean. We don't know where um, some of the deepest parts are and some of the shallowest parts are. Um, But we think this seamount Um, is the deepest, is the tallest, because it comes from a very deep part of the ocean and rises up um, a lot of um, meters above the seafloor into some of the shallower waters. So we're pretty sure um, that this is the biggest seamount, but there's still a lot of ocean out there. So we might discover one that's even bigger. Amazing. Thank you very much, Lucy. Lucy, we've had some questions um, come through which are pre-submitted, so just just to let um, all users know that you can pre-submit questions. Um, Parents can sign up uh, for an account and submit those um, at least 24 hours in advance of any live lesson. We've got some from um, Eva Gonzalez, um, and um, she would like to know, you've talked about a lot about this this diversity and all these, these animals. How many new species have, have, have you actually discovered or, or the expeditions you've been on discovered? Yes, great question. So, of course, every time we go to sea, we're incredibly privileged to be the first humans ever to see that bit of our planet. And that's pretty mind-blowing. So it's quite likely that when we go, we find new species. And this is all the way from some of those really large corals that we've seen in the pictures, remember that sort of blue, that um, pink um, tree-like coral, um, all the way down to the very tiny worms. So I can tell you that when I was working on those very small worms, about 95% of the worms that we found were new to science. In fact, there were so many that we didn't name them. I just gave them numbers and letters because it was just too much work to try and name them all. So they're there, they're in the Natural History Museum in London. They've been very carefully catalogued so that researchers in the future will be able to know that we've collected them, although they're not formally described. Because that process of formally giving something a name is quite long. And this is really important because this means that you have to look back and see what's happened in the past and what other organisms and other little worms look the same as your little worm and you have to diagnose what those differences are. And that's quite a long process, and I'd still be doing it now if I was going to name all of those little worms. However, our expedition last year, um, we already know we found three different species of coral that are new to science. Um, And that's that's pretty mind-blowing, thinking that coral itself is really quite big, and there's been lots of different expeditions across the globe. So lots more for everyone out there who's listening today to explore um, when they become their marine scientists of the future. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. And another great question that's come on the live chat. This is from Camille. Um, and, and it's really asking about how many people have been down to these deep trenches, these deepest parts of the ocean. So maybe where, where these some of these seamounts start. Um, it, uh, is that a popular place to go for a scientist? <laughs> well, lots of scientists would like to go there. However, there's very, not very much equipment that allows us to go down into the depths. So you can imagine what happens when we go down through the water. There's a lot of pressure. It's very dark. So as you heard yesterday, the equipment that we use to explore the deep sea is very special. Now, there's only one submersible in the world right now that we can use as scientists to explore the very deep parts of the ocean. 
So that means actually there's only a handful, less than 10 people have been into the very deepest parts of the ocean. However, often we don't put people inside submersibles to go and explore. We use remotely operated vehicles, remote robots that we can control from the surface of the, ocean, of the ship. Um, and then we get them to go down to explore for us. So a lot of our exploration isn't done like um, I am in the, the picture where I showed you the questions and actually looking out at the seafloor. It's me on a ship with the pilots um, and then we're looking remotely at these places. Amazing. Um, I mean, it's it's it seems like it's a privilege to go down. And and there's a question come, which has come through from from Paula just to sort of distinguish some of the life in the sea. And 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 it's, you've talked about the importance of sea mounts to support life, and the question is: Can all marine species live near mountains, or is that or the, asks, or is it too dangerous for some different species? Yeah. yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, really thinking about um, the benefits of being there, but also some of the challenges. So, of course, one of the benefits is that there's hard rock to attach to. So if you're a coral, that's great. However, as we've learned, those corals provide homes for lots of other things. Um, so they're quite good for sheltering. Um, so if you're a very small fish, like one of those pictures we saw it hiding in the middle of a coral. Um, but of course, that means that large predators come around on the seamounts. So some of the small animals just have to live in the corals and not move around very much. So kind of like some of us today, we're in our homes. Um, however, because seamounts generally, even the tops, the little tippy tops of the seamounts are still quite deep. They're deeper than we could ever hold our breath and swim to, or even something like scuba diving, they're way deeper than that. So there are animals have specially adapted to live in these places. So what we'd normally say is seamounts are great for our deep sea animals. And those that live around our coasts are specially adapted to living there, and that's where they live. But remember, a lot of our coastal areas are just really big seamounts with the tops of them coming up out of the ocean. So really, we all live around these seamounts, even us as humans. And does does that well I mean there's questions coming in is like what makes a seamount how, how does it form does that mean the whole of the UK is a seamount the top of a seamount where 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 do you draw the line yeah so our official definition of seamount is they have to rise off the sea floor for a thousand meters um and seamounts are distinct places so of course most of our continent actually aren't seamounts they are these large continental masses um, that have been above the sea for many generations. However, some of our island communities really are seamounts. Um, so, of course, as scientists, we have these really clear definitions. Um, but, of course, out there we have seamounts that are not just a thousand metres high, they're five thousand meters high so you can imagine just like from a hill to a mountain they get really they're really different um and we have some that are just a few hundred meters but if even if you're only a few hundred meters off the seafloor and all around you is sediment that is still a really important environment um <laughs> this is a question i love from this is from ralph in in, in year five who would love to know what is the most unusual creature that you have seen on a sea mount? Oh gosh, um, there's, there's so many because often life looks really different because it's adapted to live down in the deep sea. So something I was really surprised and made me smile when I first saw it was a type of sea star. So we can see those in our rock pools um, around our coastlines. But there's a type of sea star that has evolved to live in the deep sea, and it's called a crinoid. And it's got lots of arms. And it swims around like this. 
and it almost looks alien-like. So if we can put a nice link up um, for a YouTube um, video, it's pretty cool. And when I first saw it, I was like, that is what I would imagine an alien to be. But actually, it's not. It's um, an organism that has adapted to live um, at depth in the ocean, and it's got so many arms because it's trying to pull in all the water, um, sort of little creatures in the water, everything floating by that it can eat off into its mouth. So it's got lots of really feathery arms. And that's, that's a deep sea crinoid, you said? That's right, yes, deep sea crinoid. Perfect. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing a, a video. How, how many different species of animal specifically have we discovered on, on, on sea mounts and maybe how many more might there be out there waiting to be discovered? Well, that's a brilliant question because you know what? That is one of the questions we are trying to answer when we go to sea. Because the answer is at the moment, we don't know. So that's kind of two parts because it's really challenging to get to some of these places. As we've already explained, some of the really um, high tech equipment that we need to go and explore. Um, but also, once we have collected the images and some of the creatures that are down on the seafloor, we have to spend many years with experts trying to identify them. And some of them, as we've already spoken about in these questions, are new to science. And that takes quite a long time. So we've got hundreds of thousands of species that live on seamounts and around them. And remember, just like our whales using seamounts, to help their migration patterns. There are some things that live there all the time, like our corals, but like our whales, some things come and go. They're transitory. Um, we also have to think about how many seamounts have we gone and looked at? So those that have been explored by scientists like myself that look at the biology are only a handful, a few in the Pacific, a few more in the Atlantic, and a tiny number in the Indian Ocean, in the area between Seychelles and Maldives, that map that I showed you of the Indian Ocean earlier, none of those have been explored biologically. So we have no idea what's down there. All I can say is I'm pretty sure that there's new species. Can I, can I ask a question, Lucy? So sure, you down, can, the, Jimmy. down on the what's the weirdest thing you we might find? Are we going to find like a dinosaur or some you know huge you know alien squid creature or what? What could we find down there? And I know that as a scientist, you'd like to sort of talk about sort of like evidence and data, but it, it, if you let your imagination run, yes. Well, I've got a good imagination, so uh, I don't find that too hard. Um, I think. What do we have down there? Well, we're unlikely to find dinosaurs um, because we know they were air breathing and we don't have dinosaurs down at depth because there's the ocean, right? And they had lungs and we need gills. Okay, so there's special adaptations that we have on all the creatures that live in the ocean to allow them to live there. And we know from our recent explorations that there are whole new types of habitats, whole new ways of getting energy into, um, into creatures that are found on the sea floor. We can see some very big things, some of our things like vampire squid, absolutely huge. Um, we thought they were around, there was some a little bit evidence from stories in history, but only relatively recently have scientists actually seen these things. So I think out there, there probably is some huge creature living down in the depths. What that actually looks like, we don't know. But one of the adaptations for things living at depth and in the cold is actually things to go really big. So we can maybe see some of our giant isopods that down, live in and around Antarctica and in some of the trench environments. And they're just like our wood lice, so probably about this size in our gardens, but down in the ocean, they're this big. So they've increased massively inside, and that's how they've adapted to live in these places. 
So as we go out there and we explore, we found new life, but not only new life, but how that life um, interacts with different life and also the environment that it lives in, that'll help us understand this amazing ocean that is really our planet. Brilliant, Lucy. I mean, it's, I, mean, I find it all fascinating and, and the sort of deep sea gigantism that you referred to is, is I mean, the, the idea of a one foot roly poly or woodlouse. Um, I think there's even a video um, somewhere online of, of one chewing off a, a shark's head that's been caught in a trap. These are the, these are the things of nightmares. <laughs> but to go back to some oceanography, we've got a question from Electro Skull 57. And I think this was asked to Oliver yesterday. And it is is about um, some, some basics. It is is how do underwater waterfalls work? Ah, okay. Really interesting. Yeah. So we haven't really had the opportunity yet today to really think about how the ocean works. Because, of course, we're all in different places across the globe. We can look out to our ocean and say, right, this is my bit. But if we look at our planet, we see that actually all the oceans are connected. So we might describe them as the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean. Actually, all those bits of water are connected. Um, and this is really important. This is what creates some of our weather and the winds on the planet sort of pull the water around. When it gets cold and extra salty, then it sinks down at the poles. And we call this an ocean conveyor belt. Um, and it's just like the, all of the oceans are connected um, and the water flows around at the surface, but also down at depths as well. And we have these underwater features like underwater waterfalls when we have this really cold water that is extra salty and that's still really dense so that flows down and then we have water that's warming um flowing up so it's just a matter of a really specific and really unique part um on the planet that gets these um, this sort of mechanism in place. In fact, that's one of the really interesting aspects about seamounts. Seamounts, because they're like a barrier to water flow, means that this cold, salty water is pushed up into warm waters. This is especially important in our tropical areas where there's um, a smaller amount of nutrition and this cold water is often quite nutrient rich. So this is another reason why we think seamounts are really important because they push this water um, up from depth. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much. I mean, just comparing also, um, you mentioned before during, during your talk, uh, the difference between deep water and shallow water coral communities. Mm. And, and so the, the question, the question, if I can just find it is, is, are the corals the same animal that you find if you are sort of the typical sort of you know, mm -hmm. tourist type sort of scuba diving you know, coral reef? Yeah. So although we call them all corals, they're all very different species because those that um, form those hard water, shallow coral reefs that you might see um, either snorkeling or scuba diving, um, they've adapted um, with other organisms to use light to for their energy, um, and they have a little um, a little algae in them that creates their energy, and the energy from that little algae goes into the coral, and that creates the energy. It's a symbiosis. It's a way for both of the organisms to benefit from this relationship. However, if you think about the deep sea, what do you think about? We've already spoken about a lot of pressure, being cold, but the big thing is there's no light. So down past about a thousand meters, there's no light at all. So we can't have corals living there that rely off uh, energy from the sun. Instead, they're filter feeders and they pull in their food from the, the, all the little particles that are going past in the water column. So they have often have these really big polyps. If you remember 
that image that I showed earlier that was um, uh, a magnification of that beautiful pink tree octocoral. Brilliant. And, and I mean, I find that sort of fascinating. And I think just, just moving on from that, I've got another question that, that's come up here. And, and that's, um, you're talking about the lack of light in the deep sea, and you showed that image of the anglerfish um, during the presentation, and, and how it uses that luminescent lure uh, to attract prey. Why, why are fish attracted to that light? And why haven't they adapted not to go towards that light? <laughs> right. Well, again, um, really interesting. So, in fact, they're attracted to the light um, pretty much because it's something new and a bit different, right? We're all like that, see something a bit sparkly and we, we get interested. So, um, so that's one aspect, also sort of curiosity and, you know, a potential of understanding maybe there's just a trickle of light sometimes that comes down um, and there's a bit of reflection. So that could be food for themselves. Now, it's absolutely right to think, well, hey, if there's an adaptation towards creating light, there must be adaptations to be able to think that, um, you know, to try and move away from the light. And in, in fact, that's absolutely true. So we have adaptations and counter adaptations all the time. Um, and we can think about some of those with some of the fish that are higher up in the water column. They almost like have little light bulbs that look, that are uh, focused downwards. So it means that their shadow from underneath isn't seen quite so well. We can see that in some of our uh, sharks and our tuna. The top of them is quite pale in color and their underneath is a bit darker. So again, um, this counter color um, helps them um, get camouflaged against the light. So light in the ocean is really key to help us understand what's living there. So I'm going to move, move, Lucy. I'm afraid we've got time for about one or two more questions. And we've got one um, here from Winston who would like to know how can there be, we talked about waterfalls, but how can there be rivers under the sea? Yeah, well, exactly the same way, Winston. Um, what we have here is changes in density and changes in density in the ocean come from the temperature of the water and the salinity of the water. So we've spoken about our ocean being one ocean across the whole of the planet. But just like on land and you'll feel that breeze come across your face sometimes, it's one big area of air, but there's other um, like wind going through, we get that same thing in the ocean. So we have this transport across the planet, our conveyor belt, where ocean is, where uh, warm water is rising and deep water and cold water is sinking down to the seabed, and this creates these rivers across the planet. So, just to, so if you had this really cold, salty water almost like a sort of a section of it and it, it stays separate from the warmer water around it. So it's like it's a river flowing through the middle of the ocean. It is, yeah. And in fact, if you're lucky enough to go down and have a look through these, you can see where that changes. We call them um, thermoclines, where it's just thermo, which is temperature, and cline means a change. And you can see it's almost kind of like... Um, like almost you're going through a bit of mist or something. It's kind of, um, it's a really weird sensation when we go through these barriers. So there really are these physical barriers to change. But the thing to remember is they don't always stay in the same place all the time, right? It keeps moving. I mean, we've very sadly only got time for two more, two more questions. Um, the first is from Camille, who would who wants to be a scientist um, uh, when she grows up, but doesn't know whether to choose physics or chemistry. Um, so it's oh, quite very a, good. But, but, but it's interesting because just generally, what what kinds of things should people, young people, be thinking about um, in terms of subject choices to to do a career in science? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great question, and I would say um, that. I did, I focused on biology, chemistry and physics because especially in the marine environment, as you've heard today, we've spoken about 
a lot of biology. I've shown you those pictures. A lot of the questions today have come from a lot of physics when we're thinking about density and chemistry when we're thinking about those salinities. And when we go to sea, we take a mixture of scientists. We take chemists, physicists, biologists, and people who are specialists in lots of different areas. So I would say um, explore what you're interested in. If you're interested in it, you're going to give it all of your efforts. Um, and that's going to be really interesting to you. And it's your ability to ask questions about your environment that's going to make you a really great scientist. And if you're interested in it, then that's going to help you ask those really amazing questions. Amazing. Thank you. And then the last question, um, this is from Caroline. Um, is it possible for a sea mount to develop in the Hadal zone, which is a fairly, I mean, maybe we'll have to say what the Hadal zone is and then sort of, you know, how it can develop from there. Yes, it's great. So yeah, really specific question there. So the Hadal zone is our deepest areas in the ocean. It's the area, the zone of the ocean that essentially is kind of the, the, the valleys of our trenches. Okay, so it's all super deep. What do we know about the Hadal zone? Well, it's quite cold across the planet. It's about two, three degrees. Um, Almost no light, we'd say pretty much no, no light gets down there. Um, and there's a lot of pressure. So things that live down there are very special. Um, so our hadal zones generally are in the trenches and they have been formed previously from when um, our tectonic plates have collided. So what you would find is generally not any seamounts actually in the Hadal zones, but kind of around the sides of them. Now, of course, I can never say never because the ocean is so big and there are lots of complex processes. And this is one of the interesting questions that we want to try and ask um, and why mapping the seafloor and knowing where the valleys and the mountains are is really important. Lucy, thank you so, so much uh, for all this amazing insight into the underwater world. It's been a, a real pleasure um, listening and learning. I'm, I'm waiting for you guys to discover uh, sort of um, the, 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 the Meg um, on, on one of your next expeditions. It seems that sort of if we're going to have a gigantic shark, um, it might be in, in, in the deep ocean. But there's much more than that in so far as that to learn how um, we have so much diversity under the water as we, we, we do on land that we shouldn't just, we need to look beneath the surface. I can see that wonderful ocean surface behind you um, on, on, on the screen. And, and, we just, and it's what's so great about the work you do is you take us beneath the surface and, and show us um, these amazing underwater worlds. So thank you so, so much. Oh, my, my pleasure. It's an absolute privilege to be able to share some of these amazing images. And of course, a fantastic privilege to go and explore these areas with fantastic scientists from across the region we're working. Um, and before we say goodbye to everyone at home, just to let you know that tomorrow we have a uh, live lesson, a couple of live lessons, which is exploring the deep. And that will be Mike, who's operations in charge of operations on, at Necton. And he'll be talking about all the different roles that's involved, that are involved in, in exploring the deep and how you might be able to do those as a job um, in the future. And then on Thursday, we've got Patrick from Triton, who I think I'm right in saying is one of only eight people in the entire world who's been to the deepest point on the planet. Um, so that's going to be super, super exciting. And then on uh, Friday, um, I think we have one of the uh, Seychelles uh, scientists who will be talking about the link between all this amazing science and how that helps us conserve and protect the ocean. But for now, thank you for being part of Necton Submarine STEM 2020. It's goodbye from me. Bye. And probably goodbye from Lucy. And from me too, yeah. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.